Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Wool Museum for the first talk of the day, here at least. Uh, yep, yeah, everyone here? Cool. So uh, we're, we're here, as I said, for the first talk of the day at the Wool Museum. I'd like to introduce uh, Stefan Goetz with his talk, uh, Open Source Formal Methods, Are We There Yet? I hope I'm on the mic. Cool. Um, my name is Stefan. Hi. Thanks for making the trek over through the rain. Appreciate it. Um, so open source formal methods, um, what got me into that? Um, it's because at some stage I started caring about bugs. And the reason for that is that I've been uh, developing embedded software for a few, quite a few years now. And um, in particular, I've been working with and contributing to a uh, real-time operating system, Ekronos, um, it's written in C. And that is used in a couple of projects, among them um, drone flight control software. Um, that is a, uh, used in a research project. It's also used in a commercial setting uh, for uh, medical um, devices. And so bugs, well, they tend to have an impact that can be personal injury. I don't want to resp be responsible for that. And by extension, that can have a financial or a legal impact to myself, to my employer, to my customers. I also don't really want that. But maybe that's just me. Do you care about bugs? So when we look at that, if you work in one of those fields, of automotive, um, aviation, finance, you might. If you use any of these things up there, you probably appreciate the fact that they hopefully don't kill you if and there are hopefully no bugs in the software running them. Um, but even if you're not working in those industries or a developer, um, you might still not be off the hook because um, if you look at projects in those commercial areas um, where such products are developed, then um, you look at a code repository and you figure out, oh, there's, there's maybe 10 or maybe even less percent of in-house code in that code repository. Everything else is libraries, build tools, heaps and heaps of infrastructure. And um, that might be something that you might be working on. So pretty much any remotely useful code could end up in such a repository and could ultimately um, somehow contribute to making a safety critical product. And um, that is, well, I'm in that area and that is why I do care about bugs. And it, might apply to you as well. So what do we do about bugs? Um, software analysis. Um, basically, finding structured methods um, that help us to, to find bugs and prevent bugs before they get to um, the customer, to the user. Um, so in this talk, I'm mainly going to talk about automated software analysis. Um, we have um, applied several tools to this Ekronos um, operating, uh, real-time operating system. Um, but in this talk, I'm going to focus on the open source tools. Um, and of course, I'm going to tell you what kinds of results we've achieved, what kind of bugs we found, um, what the challenges are, what's difficult um, to use, where we could improve. So that's what will uh, keep us busy for the next 40 minutes. Um, if there are any questions, interrupt me anytime. I'm happy to take questions. The talk is structured into three main blocks. I'll uh, briefly talk about software reliability in general and how we go about achieving reliable software, making reliable software. And then a block on um, static analysis and one on model checking. So software reliability in a Commercial area usually means that a company, when it's developing a product and when it wants to bring it to the market, has to use standards in the, or has to follow standards in the development uh, process. And um, it n needs to have its products go through certifications. There are heaps and heaps of standards out there. Um, you're probably familiar with the ISO 9000 ones because they're generic quality standards that um, are used in all kinds of different businesses, not just software development. But then, of course, there are also software development specific standards specific to particular industries and so on and so forth. The list is enormous. 
There are lots of regulatory bodies um, for, um, again, all the different industries, automotive, aviation, uh, medical devices, and so on and so forth, um, that will test your products and give it the thumbs up or not. And um, a number of different associations usually come up with um, rules, with best practices that you should follow in order to make your product safe and avoid um, issues and bugs. But um, what all these standards um, boil down to really are best practices. So they, it sounds like a lot of paperwork, and it sometimes can be. But it often enough really means that um, you just need to follow a structured software development uh, life cycle. That um, you basically need to use common sense to achieve high quality software. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of, this is, of that is manual. Um, and since we're all human, we can still, despite the best um, processes in place, um, make mistakes, forget something, and obviously overlook a bug. So um, what, that's why I was interested in automating um, this process and trying to eliminate bugs automatically. And of course, for some of these standards, for some of the stricter ones, you actually have to have that automation in place to get your product certified um, to be marketed. So um, software analysis divides into, well, basically, first of all, two main um, parts. There's static analysis, and then there's formal methods. So I'm actually squeeze static analysis a little bit into the talk here. Um, formal methods divides into proof systems and model checking. And of course, I'm going to talk about those um, on the rest of the talk. But what I wanted to point out is that these uh, three approaches, approaches sit on a um, iron triangle where you need to make trade-offs between scalability, accuracy, and automation. So for example, static analysis is usually somewhere between scalable and fairly automatic to use. Um, with model checking, scalability is exactly one of the challenges um, that you face. So let's have a look at um, static analysis, unless there are any questions so far. No. All right. What does static analysis do for you? Well, it's, um, it looks at code. It's sort of an automated code reviewer. Um, and it only looks at the code, so it doesn't really compile your code or execute it um, to make findings. Um, and actually, in some areas, and especially in the security area, when um, those people talk about code review, they usually mean the combination of using an, a static analysis tool along with an actual normal human reviewer who looks at code and um, tries to evaluate its uh, quality. Um, however, static analysis tools are to some regard similar to compilers in that they share the input side, so to speak. So they both need to parse the C code. They need to analyze it to some degree. They usually generate an abstract syntax tree, uh, look at the um, control and data flow, um, that kind of thing. But of course, the static analyzer doesn't produce a binary. It uh, tells you what it thinks is wrong with your code. Um, having said that, um, compilers contain static analysis to some degree, usually as a convenience feature. So basically, when you turn on your warnings, um, and especially if you turn them into errors, you kind of get a static analyzer for free. Um, in the um, free and open source software arena for C and C++, because that is what our operating system is written in, well, C, um, there's quite a number of tools. Um, the most popular ones are BLAST, CPP, Check, Eclipse, Pharmacy. I'd like to point out a few in particular. The um, LLVM Clang compiler suit um, has a um, built-in static analyzer. Um, at least they, they market it that way. And I haven't used it much, but um, from what I've seen, it does produce very useful compiler warnings. And um, a number of static analysis tools are actually based on um, LLVM and CLang for, for parsing C. 
you might have heard of Sparse, which is a um, static analyzer that is um, used in the kernel, with the kernel, I should say. It's tailored towards finding um, code patterns that can be problematic in the Linux kernel. Um, but of course, since it, it is, since it is focused on the Linux kernel, it's um, not really applicable to, to our operating system, to eChronos. So we um, decided to go with Splint. Um, reason for that mainly is that it has a relatively generic and rich feature set and um, that it fits well into our regression test setup. Um, so what does Splint do for you? In the simplest case, it just does a little bit of pattern matching. You can basically tell it to check that all your variables follow a certain naming scheme, for example. Not particularly interesting. Um, where it gets more fun is that, of course, it has a model of the C language and it has a set of rules or patterns where it, where it can report that these are problematic code patterns, code structures. So, for example, it, of course, um, understands C types, so to speak, but um, where a C compiler usually allows you everything that is allowed in the C standard, Splint or a static analysis tool would warn you about legal ways of using types that still might use to issues in your code. And um, other features in that area are looking at data, aliasing, function interfaces, but I won't go into detail there. And um, where it, the most sophisticated part is the control and data flow analysis. Where that helps you is if you have your program structured into several modules and say you have a pointer variable, you do a malloc, assign the result of malloc to the pointer in your one module, then you pass around the pointer through several functions, through several modules, C files, and it ends up being used somewhere else in your code. Um, then Splint can still figure out, oh, you passed that around through all these functions, and if you use that pointer without actually having it checked whether it is null or not, at this point in your program, it can point you to where it was initially initialized and say, hey, you initialized it there, you're using it there, you've never checked it for null, you better do that. So how did we use it for eChronos? How did we integrate it with eChronos? Um, you start off by just enabling as many warnings in your compiler as you can because your static analysis tool will point out all those compiler warnings anyway. So just get those out of the way. That's really the first step. Um, so then Splint, you really basically run it like your uh, compiler. Um, so you just need to pass it your list of source files and um, your include pass, that sort of thing. Um, so it's not really hard to set up in, to integrate it into your regression test system. Um, it's useful to run it against your entire code base because that allows it to do that control and data flow analysis throughout your whole program and basically perform better checks. What uh, we had to do for eChronos, uh, since it is um, very low level code, including some assembly code, was to, to hide the um, architecture specific code, the assembly code, and the compiler extensions uh, from Splint because it doesn't support them or it doesn't by default ignore them, um, which was not a big drama. Just had to um, use basically if defs to uh, make Splint ignore that stuff. And um, what's really nice about it is that it's fast. It doesn't really impact our, our, our test cycle or our development cycle in terms of how long it takes to execute at all. So that's really useful. Well, what are the results? Um, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, the good are the um, improvements that we could make based on what Splint reported. The, um, the bad is basically the false positives or negatives, however you want to look at it. And well, I'll get to the ugly. So the good. Um, eChronos uses a lot of code generation and we had um, code that didn't look particularly pretty and um, Splint complained a lot about that. So um, we just decided to clean that up. We improved the readability of that code. It's not really a bug, but 
code readability is a good thing overall, so um, that was definitely improvement. There was a bug in um, a print hex function, so it takes a, um, an integer and prints out a hex, is, it prints it out as an ASCII hex character on the console. So it's a debug function. It's um, no drama there that we had a bug there, um, but still nice that Splint found that. And um, what was actually a bug in the Artos API, and where I'm very happy that uh, we used Splint to find that was that there was this um, signal handling function um, that was supposed to return a signal set, but what it actually returned was a Boolean value. And so your signal set always was either zero or one, and that of course was not the intended result. Um, so Splint picked that up, we could fix that bug, that was actually really good. Um, and fortunately, it didn't find any other bugs. Um, so to the bad, to the false positives, um, we have a fair bit of unused code in the Artos in the sense that it's sort of a library, so when you put an application on top of an operating system, that application doesn't necessarily call all your operating system functions. And then Splint complains, hey, uh, your application isn't, you know, it, it's not using those functions, so you might as well get rid of them, except that, well, obviously we don't want to get rid of them. Um, so what you do in that case is you annotate those functions with, in a special format that Splint understands when it passes the code, and um, then it stops complaining about it. And um, similar issues around function parameters and variables. For the function parameters, it's a little bit annoying that uh, Splint doesn't understand the GCC extensions that you can use to do the exact same thing for GCC so that GCC doesn't complain about the unused function parameter in that case. But, oh well, that's not a big deal, just a little bit annoying. Um, Functions that do not return, we have that, you annotate it, the warning goes away, that's fine. Type checking, here for me the lesson was you need to find a bit of a balance of um, what you consider good and readable code and whether you want it to be that way even though Splint would complain about it or whether you really want to change your code because you agree with what Splint complains about. So here, for example, this while not star string is a typical construct to iterate over a string until you hit the null character. And Splint doesn't like it because you're applying this not, this Boolean operator to a um, character type. Um, in that case, we decided to change the code just to make that, that mismatch of types go away. In the second case, um, another typical pattern is if you want to convert a, an ASCII character to a decimal, sorry, to an integer number, you just subtract the, the um, zero literal for ASCII zero. Um, and again, you mix integer operations with uh, character type, Splint doesn't like it, but in that case we decided, no, we want that, it is very readable. If you want to rephrase that in a manner that Splint doesn't care about, actually the code gets kind of worse, so we didn't. We disabled that check. Um, yeah, and there's data aliasing. Actually, I'll skip over that. You can, you can ask me later if you're interested. The ugly. Um, basically, where did Splint not work the way that we wanted it to work? So for some reason, um, we, we use those u and max macros in our code, and they are defined in your standard, integer, standard int headers um, that the system usually provides. For some reason, Splint didn't pick them up. We had to define them manually in our build system to tell Splint, oh, hey, that macro exists and it has a particular value, so use that. So that was weird. What was weirder was there was um, a function declaring and initializing a local variable and then using that variable, like you know, three lines below the declaration and initialization. And Splint said, hey, you haven't initialized that variable. And um, I've uh, stared at that code for quite a while. I have not figured out what is going on there. I, I would say it's a splint bug. Um, and that's where we get to one ugly aspect of splint. It's not maintained. It's not been maintained in years. And that's really unfortunate. Um, I mean, maybe the, the Clang-based tools have 
taken up that space. I don't think so from when I looked at that. Um, but that's really a shame, especially since it generally works really fine. It has provided good results for us. There are alternatives, mostly commercial tools, or well, I'm going to talk about the commercial ones here. What they usually do for you is provide more stricter, deeper checks. They're usually standards oriented. In some of those tools, some poor soul had to go to the lengths of implementing every single MISRA rule check out there. There's a lot. Couldn't have been fun. Um, in our case, we weren't really interested in MISRA, so for example, we didn't, we wouldn't even care about those rules, although of course we could decide that we would. Um, those tools often provide better usability, integrate with your IDE, integrate better with your build system, that sort of thing. They might be run as a service, so for example, Coverity does that. Um, but that means that often these tools are also geared towards particular use cases. So for, a, for example, Coverity focuses on scalability. When you run eChronos with a few thousand lines of code through Coverity, it comes up with nothing. So no bugs in eChronos. Um, so that was static analysis. Any questions? Sorry, say again? Um, not in the context of Ekronos, no. Oh, sorry, um, have we looked at Valgrind? Valgrind? No, not yet. Um, one of the, the main reason at this stage is that um, Valgrind is usually used, or mainly used to find um, um, memory leaks, and um, Ekronos does not use dynamically allocated memory, um, all memory statically allocated. So there's not much to look at for Valgrind. Yep. Did you find the return on your time invested was worth it? And did you feel like it was a valuable exercise? Was it worth investing the time of using and integrating um, splints and fixing the code accordingly? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, in this case, OK, we found this one bug. But now that it is integrated, Every check-in that we make against our repository will be checked by Splint, and it's just, it gives me the warm and fuzzy to have that happening. So that's really good. Yeah? Sort of a long one. Um, it's been over the course of years since I, Ada tried to sort of redo, language, redo a lot of this stuff in the language to avoid the errors happening. He wasn't the first to use lots of Pascal modular and other stuff. Well, that's sort of a bug that's all I'll try to summarize that as are there better languages than C out there that help you write better code and fewer bugs in the first place? Um, or should there be? And well, yes, of course. Um, but for that microcontroller that, I'm, that I have in my product and I need to get code running on, you need to give me a compiler first for whatever language you come up with. So. Of course, it would be really great to have better language support in the first place, but you, it, somebody needs to do the work. Model checking. Let's do that. What is model checking? Um, there's a model, no surprise. Um, the model is basically your application. Um, what, what your application is, is meant to do, either close to the implementation or on a more abstract level. And um, you express that in a, in a modeling language that usually needs to be mathematically strict and formal. But that just says what your application does. You uh, also need to feed it a uh, specification which says what your model is supposed to do. Um, so basically your requirements or your assertions, your tests, you need to express those in the modeling language as well. And then 
the model checker, what that thing does for you is it takes the, the model and the specification as input. It converts them to logical expressions. And that huge, massive logical expression, it represents all possible states that your model can get into as part of that logical expression. And when, when you combine that with uh, the rules of the specification, and if then the whole thing evaluates to false, it basically means one of your states of the model, or possibly one of the states in your program, violates one of your requirements or your tests. That at a high level. Now, uh, I'm sure uh, mathematically strict and formal uh, modeling languages get you all very excited. Um, so this is what model, model checking looked like for a long time. You don't need to read this. I don't want you to read this. Um, but um, you go to a tools website, um, you click on the getting started link, and you find this describing this system, so this model or program, in LOTOS is straightforward. And then you do that. And of course, it's straightforward to learn LOTOS and to convert your program into LOTOS and to convert your tests into LOTOS and do all of that without any errors or bugs and then have your model checker run on that. Well, I don't know, not my cup of tea. So um, the cool thing is that research has come a really long way. And um, for example, with CBMC, which is what we're using, you don't really need that model or that specification anymore. Or rather, what CBMC does, it, it parses the C code and converts that into a model internally um, behind the scenes for you. So what it, what it supports or understands when you give it a C program is, of course, the C standard, the C spec, and the C details itself. It understands what variables are, and that if you give a variable a value, that that is sort of one state of your model. And if you change that value in that variable, that that is a new model state, and that it will need to evaluate both of those states. And um, it does more for you. It supports um, a fairly large part of um, the POSIX standard, of your standard C library. Um, so if you do malloc, it um, has sort of an understanding and a built-in rule that malloc can return null, and that if you then dereference that pointer, that that is a bad thing, and that it should warn you about that. Um, that you can, it, it uh, can it automatically performs checks against um, array and buffer overflows, that sort of thing. And um, it has a concurrency model. So even if you use pthreads in your program, it will actually sort of understand that suddenly the thing that you spun off as a separate pthread now runs in parallel to whatever you had already been running. Um, and it even supports different memory models for different architectures. Um, so it's Pretty good for handling low-level code, as we deal with in uh, with Ekronos. Um, the way we used it is, again, you run it against your source file, and it's much like the compiler, no surprises there. It's pretty straightforward. And um, the a nice property is that when you have assertions in your code, it will automatically use those assertions as tests um, that it will try to complain about if they are ever um, violated. Um, what we had to do to actually make it run over our code base was, again, get rid of the platform-specific code, um, the assembly code, and that in this case was mainly the context switch code. Um, so just stuck that out and got rid of it. And then we ran CBMC, and it didn't give us any results because um, we have unbounded iterations um, in the code. And um, remember that the, uh, the model checker tries to evaluate all possible system states. And of course, one possible system state is that you run through your iteration once. And another one is that you run through it twice, or three times, or four times, and so on and so forth. So it just tries to explore all those possible states and never terminates, because it is an unbounded iteration. Um, so basically, you tell it, hey, nothing interesting is going to happen after the third iteration or so. And then it just it basically ignores um, all those other options that it could explore. Um, well, and then there are Ekronos tasks. So in Ekronos, 
we have um, tasks which you can think of as threads more or less for the purpose of this. Um, so they will just run more or less in parallel in your application uh, or on your, on your microcontroller. And um, we use the, for getting CBMC running a very simple version of Ekronos which had an extremely limited um, support for tasks where there is no preemption um, so a task always runs until it um, explicitly switches to a different task. And we even didn't consider interrupts. So what this looks like is um, that. Let's say super simple application, two tasks, and all they do is they do a bit of work and then they switch to the other task. And then they switch back and then to the other task. Um, so that's pretty straightforward. That's what the execution schedule would look like if you ran this on actual hardware on a, on a uni processor. And um, if you compiled such a system on Ekronos, um, your execution schedule would at that point be fixed. There is, it would always execute in this manner, in this order. And a application programmer can rely on that if you have shared data structures between these two tasks. It is safe for task A and task B to access them because they never run truly in parallel and there's strict control over when um, they are done with manipulating that data structure and then switch to the next task. Now, if you throw that at CBMC, first remember that we got rid of all that context switch code. <coughs> well, what that means is that, okay, task A starts running and then it gets to that context switch point that is just a no-op. And since it's a no-op, well, that function returns and task A keeps running and task B is never running. So that's clearly not what we want. Now, if we tell uh, CBMC, oh, hey, there's task B, run that as a, as a separate parallel um, um, entity similar to a pthread, well, obviously what happens is that CBMC thinks, oh, you're telling me that there's a second um, processor. So I'm going to run um, task B on that one, again, without context switches, and now that execution schedule, of course, has a very different outcome when you think about accesses to shared memory than what's happening in real life. So we had to teach CBMC a few lessons. Be and that's not um, the only problem, that it's not actually modeling what, what our system does. It also, again, doesn't get very far because it considers these two CPUs to run truly in parallel to, um, to um, not be synchronized. And so it thinks, well, one possible system state is that I had task A running for a bit and then task B running for a bit because for its analysis, it needs to serialize the, the execution. Um, and so it comes up with this one possible um, um, interleaving of the tasks and then another one, and then another one, and of course, again, it doesn't get very far because it thinks, wow, oh, there's so many things, so many options to explore here. I can't actually tell you what's going on because I never get to any of the assertions. Um, okay, so what did we do to um, mitigate that? First of all, we used um, um, critical sections to tell CBMC, hey, if a task is running, nothing else can run. Um, so. Basically, when task A starts, it enters a critical section, and at, from that point on, only task A can run. And CBMC doesn't consider any other task to be runnable. When task A gets to a context switch point, we turn off the critical section. And at that point, um, of course, all the other tasks are fair game again, including task A. So we now still have the problem that CBMC could say, well, I'm not going to switch to task B because task A could also run. So we had to use another mechanism in CBMC which allows you to, to filter what other possible next um, system states it considers. So we can basically tell it, well, if task A says it's going to ta switch to task B, CBMC, yes, only task B is now runnable. And that gives us the execution schedule that we have on actual hardware. And that is what we were after. Was a bit of work in there, so the results of all of that is that obviously you need a bit of plumbing code and teach CBMC a few tricks. You need to avoid those unbounded iterations. The upshot of that actually was that it made us think a bit more about 
how we handle worst case execution times in the RTOS and that that is something that we need to look at um, because of course unbounded operations kill you worst case execution time. Um, there was a um, bug in CBMC around um, this critical section handling um, but the cool thing was that I sent an email to the authors and got a fix a day later or so. Um, so that was really great. Um, and then there's scalability. Scalability is this. Um, so we're looking at this super simple application of two tasks just switching back and forth from one to the other. So that's about 300 lines of code together with the rest of even debugging code. Um, and the one number you really should be looking at is 50 task switches. So we have task A and task B switching 50 times um, from one to the other. And that already takes our execution time, the red line, um, up to 180 seconds, so to three minutes. So the whole system isn't actually doing very much, and it already takes three minutes to run CBMC. Um, that is something we need to work on. So for us, the, the results are it is work in progress. Um, if you want to use a, a model checker like CBMC, you probably need to slice and dice your program into the bits and pieces that you are interested in and feed them to the model checker instead of your whole application because it just has its state exploding if you, if you do that. So in conclusion, are we there yet? Well, it depends. Um, static analysis is a no-brainer. Um, companies, fortunately, usually do that in commercial settings, but I, open source tools should do that. Um, and there's lots of options, even if you don't want to use Splint. So for example, Coverity, um, you can use that for free for open source um, projects. And that's absolutely worthwhile. And should, nobody should go without that, I would say. At least it makes me sleep uh, a lot better at night. Model checking, it's not really out of the box. It takes a bit of work. But um, from what we can see in eChronos, I think we will have good res I mean, really useful results because it helps us check all our assertions in our code. Um, and it just has come really far over the last two years, and I hope um, that will continue in terms of research and usability. As a bit of an outlook, um, the third or the second formal method, correctness proofs, um, there's a group at NICTA slash uh, data61 um, at UNIS, associated with UNSW working on that, in, and in particular, um, developing proofs for eChronos and certain system properties of eChronos. So hopefully that is something someone can report on uh, from the team uh, maybe next year. And that's it for my talk. Um, are there any questions? Yep. whether the, uh, the correctness proofs are related to SEL4. Yeah, yeah, so it, it has been done for SEL4, which is a microkernel developed by NICTA. Um, but uh, note they have their team also working specifically on eChronos, um, and that is separate from. So is it using yeah. the same framework for SEL4 use? Yeah, it's a similar framework, yes. Um, the question is, if you want to disable a specific feature or check in the linter, whether that doesn't open you up to bugs again. Um, and of course, it does. So um, for Splint, usually you have two options. Either on the command line, you can tell it to ignore a whole class of checks. Or in the source code, you can annotate specific instances where you want Splint not to complain about that particular line. So that's usually a good middle ground. But if, say you do that three times, then suddenly you're, um, the feeling that you've linted the code goes away. Like, oh, I already disabled three things that were giving me most of the warning. So if, that, if, if you do that enough, whether it still it opens you up to bugs again, well, of, yeah, of, of course it does. It's, uh, you have to have it one way or the other. It's, 
Sorry, I think there was a question back there. Yeah, mine was the similar, oh, okay. where you annotate the code just to satisfy your, your linker. Uh, uh, you, you either cause a problem where you, you've now disabled a check that's valuable, but also other developers who come along and say, I'm to back to some of the code, mm. Yeah, you're basically pointing also out the maintainability part of it. So what we've done in that regard is um, wherever we've uh, made an annotation to disable a uh, lint warning, we've also added a pretty substantial comment of about the rationale behind it. So and you're really relying on the skills of your developers. To sure, but I mean, if somebody writes code, you rely on their skill to write code anyway, right? especially there. Do you have a comment on if the, one of the points of using the linter is to make your code cleaner, then once you start annotating it and adding a comment or writing code so that the linter likes it, suddenly it's not as clean anymore? Do those annotations make your code less readable and maybe potentially even buggier that way or, or more prone to bugs? Yeah, yeah, it's all right. It's, it hasn't been too bad in our case. Um, we have, I think we've made overall 30 annotations or so, so in a code base, of course, that is relatively small, but still, it's, that is not a drama. Uh, yep. Um, so you were showing that you were measuring the kernel running with two tasks and mm -hmm. running CBMC on that. Have you just tried running up on the kernel kernel itself? Does it make sense to just run up on the kernel? Ah, well, I guess I should have mentioned that. Um, so we ran CBMC against the combination of Ekronos and the application on top of it um, because Ekronos is not a, a kernel in the Linux sense, um, but it's more, think of it as a library, so you statically link the two together and it just forms a whole program. Um, and that's, that makes it really easy to run CBMC against the whole thing. So yes, we ran CBMC actually against the Artos, and that is our main focus. Um, for us as the developer of Ekronos, we're more interested in checking Ekronos, not the applications that run on top of it. Yep. So one of the other things you can do with a lot of formal methods thing is use it up front in the design phase. So like AWS's white paper about the way they use PLA plus to design their things. Okay. And then don't use it so much in the development, but more to clarify your thinking. Have you done much? No, so the question was whether we have used um, model checkers or mod anything, really. anything really in the design phase um, rather than the implementation phase um, or the test phase. No, not in the case of Ekronos. No. Yep. Just to repeat, um, I stand corrected. Um, there was a model of the scheduler to start with, and the scheduler implementation was based on that, along with the results of uh, the analysis of that model. And um, that can hopefully uh, in the future be extended to um, double checking the implementation again, basically. That's all the time we have, I'm afraid. Uh, but I hope you all join me in thanking Stefan for this coming. Yeah.
of us here at LCA uh, like to present you with this gift. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot.